Okay, I think most of the initial people in the waiting room are coming in. I'm sure people will trickle in, but we're going to get started. Uh, so good evening and welcome all to uh, CTA's Lawrence Bryn Mawr Modernization Virtual Town Hall. Uh, this project is located in the Uptown and Edgewater neighborhoods of Chicago and is a part of the larger Red Purple Modernization Phase 1 project, or as we like to call it, RPM. Uh, my name is Jesse Thomas. I work in community outreach for this project, and I'll be moderating tonight. So um, some of you may know this is the second of two meetings that we are having this week. Uh, we're going to be going over largely the same content um, as the previous meeting we had on Tuesday. Uh, but we're also going to have this the same format with breakout rooms. So there'll, there'll be uh, new discussions and new questions to be had in those breakout rooms. Uh, before we get started, I'll just go over real quickly a, a little bit how this virtual meeting will work. Um, as you can see, we have um, live uh, ASL interpreters. Uh, they will be uh, throughout this presentation uh, uh, providing sign language support. Um, and also in the uh, one of the breakout rooms that I will explain as, as we get to that point. Um, we are also on Facebook Live, so hello to everyone who is uh, joining through Facebook Live. Uh, welcome to all of you. Um, we're going to be recording this meeting, and it will be posted online afterwards as well for your information. Uh, we really appreciate the questions uh, that you all provided in the registration. Uh, we hope that we will be addressing uh, a lot of those questions, and uh, if we don't in our presentation, uh, you will be able to ask specific questions in the breakout rooms that we have. And if there isn't time for that, uh, we're going to give you lots of ways to reach out and we'll be able to follow up with your questions. So I'm going to go over this agenda that you can see on the screen here. Um, uh, this is kind of how the meeting will go. Uh, we're going to first go over the project generally and have an overview and timeline um, of it. Uh, we'll be going over the station designs as well. Um, then we'll be going into the stage A, uh, as we call it, construction. That's the stage that is coming up uh, in, the in the neighborhoods. Uh, we'll be talking about the impacts associated with that construction, um, both to the community and then also to CTA service. We'll talk about how to stay informed and stay in touch with us in the RPM project. Uh, we give a lot of different options for that. And we wanna make sure you know about them. And then we will have uh, the breakout rooms that I've, I've already mentioned. Next slide. These will be the breakout room topics. I, I will, when we get to the point, I'll give instructions on how to uh, utilize the breakout rooms and we'll be going out with um, uh, six different rooms with subject expert, uh, subject matter experts in each of these categories. There are construction process, alternate parking, station design, service impacts and ADA accessibility, open for business and general questions. So uh, that's what we'll be going over uh, in the breakout rooms. So I want to extend a special welcome um, to some guests that we have here with us tonight. Uh, Alderman James Kappelman, of the 46th Ward, Alderman Matt Martin of the 47th Ward, and Alderman Harry Osterman of the 48th Ward. Uh, we're, we actually have the opportunity to hear from two of them, Alderman Kappelman and Alderman Osterman. Uh, we're going to see if we can unmute. So we'll start with Alderman Kappelman. Uh, if you could unmute and see if you can get your, we can get your screen highlighted uh, to say a few words. Uh, thank you so much. And you'll see in my screen, Actually, I took that photo when I was taking the train to uh, to visit a friend living in Edgewater. So that's right along the area where we look to have new uh, train stations. The good news is that we've done this before. At the uh, Wilson L station, we had a brand new station, a $203 million uh, renovation. And we learned a lot from that. All those things that we've learned we are going to use that information to help with all the renovations that we're doing on these uh, four different tracks. Uh, in the 46th Ward, and actually a lot of the North Side, a lot of us do not own cars. 
in the 46th ward, close to 50% of us do not own a car. And my guess is that within 20%, most of us, uh, probably maybe not any of us will own a car. We will rely on mass transit. That's why this is so, so important. I'm very, very excited about it. Um, and we're here to um, do everything we can to make sure this process goes well. So thank you CTA for your commitment to the city of Chicago. Thank you, Alderman. Appreciate your words and your support. Um, Alderman Osterman, let's see if we can get unmuted and highlighted. Alderman. Glad to be with all of you tonight. Uh, this is a project that is a transformative project for our community. Um, this is a project that's 10 years in the making and uh, we've been talking about it, planning for it, and the reality is it's, it's gonna be upon us very soon. Our goal is to make sure that um, we as a community can get through the project, that we can support the residents who are impacted, we can support the businesses that are impacted. When this is done, it's gonna be a significant investment in, in transportation and in our entire community for, for decades and decades to come. Um, so you're gonna see some really interesting designs uh, today about our stations and what they're gonna look like. You're gonna hear about the construction. Uh, my office and myself are gonna be with everyone kind of every step of the way through this as we have been so any feedback questions please reach out to us and let us know and uh, we're looking forward to um, the work ahead and uh, the impact that will be in a positive way on the transportation in our overall community thank you alderman and thank you to you both and your dedicated staff to uh, working with us and the rpm team uh, and helping to help minimize the impacts as much as possible uh, we really appreciate it. Um, we look forward to continuing working with uh, with all of the aldermen of the, of the project area. So um, one other note before we get into the presentation, uh, I've noticed some people are using the chats, which is fine, but we, we are going to have uh, the breakout rooms where uh, we want to be address be able to address specific questions that uh, about the project, about our presentation. Um, whatever's on your mind. So I, I would ask that we hold off on questions on the chat and um, we'll, we'll address them in the breakout room. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Katrina Denny. She is an RPM project manager and she's going to get us started. Katrina. All right. Thanks, Jesse. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Katrina. And like Jesse said, I work for CTA as one of the construction project managers on the project. And I am super excited to be here tonight because starting stage A is a huge milestone for the project, for the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr modernization project, right? Um, but before we, get, before we get into the timeline, the construction that takes place during stage A um, and the service impacts are, we just, we wanna take a brief moment to um, go do an overview of what the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr modernization project actually is. There, there may be attendees tonight who are new here or just moved to the area and have no idea what we're talking about. So at a high level, the Lawrence to Bryn Mawr modernization project is doing exactly what the previous slide said there, right? Replacing century old stations and track structures in the project area. So more specifically, if your station is Lawrence, Argyle, Berwyn or Bryn Mawr, at the end of the project, you're going to have a brand new modern station that is fully accessible. There's going to be an elevator and an escalator at these four stations, and the platforms are going to be much wider and longer than they are today, totally brand new as well. And then in addition to the stations, the entire track structure from Lawrence to Bryn Mawr is going to be rebuilt in a new modern structure with all new track and systems infrastructure on top. So these, these improvements are really needed. Um, as everyone here likely knows, if you're here, you likely take the stations or, or you, you know, ride the L, you see stations and the current stations and track structure is in pretty rough shape in some areas. So the next set of slides we have are just a photo of the current station and then the renderings of the future new permanent station. So this is gonna give everyone a feel of what's to come 
in a few years after putting up with our construction in the area. Um, but at this point, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Alzira and Victor. Um, if we can get them highlighted on the screen, that'd be good. They are two of the design architects with the design team who are going to do a much better job walking through some of the architectural details of the new station designs. Thank you, Katrina. Hello, my name is Alcira Maldonado Precision, uh, AIA. I'm a design architect with EXP. I'm going to take you to the design of the first two stations on the RPM project. And our first station is the Lawrence Station. The existing Lawrence Station is a gated entrance on the south side of the street. The viaduct at this location is a steel structure that has a low street clearance and the structure impacts the visibility that goes ac across the street. The Lawrence Station is located in the historic Uptown Entertainment District that is characterized by having a variety of architecture styles, which we can see in buildings like the Uptown Theater, the Post Office, or the Aragon Theater just east of the station. Unlike the existing station, the main entrance will be on the north side of the street. The station entrance takes advantage of the increased height of the new track structure by providing a tall volume with a big central uh, glass bay at the Lawrence entrance uh, that allows for natural light visibility and transparency for security. The asymmetry of the station design has a playful composition to support the life of the neighborhood and its dynamic entertainment venues. This is dramatized by a linear uh, lighting fixture that traces the playful pattern uh, on the facade. Across the street on the south side of the street, there is the auxiliary station, which is an exit only. So this station is like lower in deference to the main station. This station house uh, also has an asymmetrical facade that is emphasized by the linear lighting that traces the playful pattern on the openings. The Lawrence Station intends to be a gateway to the Uptown Entertainment District. The proposed overhead lighting panels between the station houses not only tie the stations across the street, but proposes to alter the point of arrival to a dynamic and animated space. In a night of a show or a premiere of a movie, the uh, panels overhead will provide color changing uh, lights or graphics that will be displayed up there. Our second stop is the Argyle Station. The existing Argyle Station is on the north side of the street. The existing track structure has a low street clearance and a forest of columns at the public way that obscure the views to the station entrance and impacts the visibility across the street. The Argyle Station sits in a unique location, the West Argyle Street Historic District. This is a very animated and dynamic street as well, uh, and at times it serves as a civic space. The main station entrance will remain on the north side of the street, and it takes advantage of the increased height provided by the new track structure. The building height steps up at the entrance to create a safe and welcoming entry. The new station design is influenced by both traditional and contemporary Asian architecture. In response to the animated and cultural diversity that is on the district, the station features a red terracotta cladding that symbolizes the color for good luck and prosperity that is recognized in the Asian culture. The design is also influenced by the physical context. So the new station will feature the historical columns, the original ones, uh, that they will be restored and reinstalled in the main station. Next, please. The auxiliary station will be on the south side of the street, and it is really similar in design to the main station house. It is taller central volume, and it has a projecting canopy onto the street. All stations will feature new LED lighting and are more open to the street. The new track structure spans across the street, improving visibility and lighting at the viaduct. A Tetris light pattern translation of the Asian gating pattern on the ceiling and mirror on the ground plane will create a space within the viaduct that forms a room that will tie the two stations together. 
And at the times that the street is serving as a civic space, like the Argyle Night Market, the illuminated panels will display color changing lighting or graphics too. With that, I will pass it along to my colleague, Victor Jimenez, who will take you to the next two station designs. Thank you, Alzira. My name is Victor Jimenez, AIA, a design architect at EXP, the lead architects and engineers for the new station. I will take you through the design of the next two stations, and the next stop is the Bryn Mawr, or sorry, the Berwyn station. Uh, just like at Argyle, the existing track structure at Berwyn is concrete and has a low street clearance that obscures views of the station entrance. So just, just as with the existing station, uh, the main entrance for the new uh, Berwyn station will be located on the south side of the street. The station entrance here opens up to the west with a glass system wrapping the corner. Uh, the entrance also has been slightly set back from the sidewalk and a large canopy wraps the track structure and reaches out to the street. Uh, the, the goal here was to try to make the track column a focal point uh, with an array of lights that radiates out to announce the station entrance. The Berwyn main station house, as Katrina mentioned, will be fully accessible and includes an elevator and escalator for passengers. The auxiliary station house at the north side of the street is exit only and matches the layout of the main station with exit gates located towards the west. The two station houses will be connected by a, a marked crosswalk and overhead panels that will be a safe mid-block crossing point for passengers. The final new station of the RPM project is the Bryn Mawr station. Just like at Berwyn and Argyle, the existing track structure at, at Bryn Mawr is concrete and has this forest of columns that impacts the visibility across the street. For the new station, uh, the main entrance will be located on the north side of Bryn Mawr and is influenced by the rhythm, materials, and character of the surrounding historic district. The station design takes advantage of the increased height provided by the new track structure and steps up the building height at the entrance to create a bright open entry that is intended to complement the historic streetscape. Like the Argyle station, the main station will feature historic columns from the original station, which will be restored and reinstalled. The columns frame the entrance doors and are complemented by the white terracotta piers. As with the other stations, the main station house will be fully accessible and includes an elevator and escalator. The auxiliary station at the south side of Bryn Mawr is a similar design as the main station house with a taller central area and a, and a projecting canopy. Unlike the other stations, the auxiliary station at Bryn Mawr will serve as both an exit and entrance for the station. And one unique feature of the Bryn Mawr station is that it also includes a third station house, one block north of Hollywood Avenue. This station house will be fully accessible and includes an additional elevator for passenger use. The design of the station house is similar to the main, uh, state, main entrance with a taller central glass entrance. With that, I'll pass it back to Jesse. All right, thank you all for taking us through those amazing renderings. I, I think the designs are wonderful and I can't wait to use these stations once completed. So uh, we're going to learn a little bit more now on how we are going to get to that point of uh, new tracks and new stations uh, in the project area. Uh, so we're going to turn our attention to the stage A construction. Uh, we'll be going over the approach that um, CTA and the contractor that is building is taking towards this work. Um, then we're going to get into the details of how the work will be done. Uh, we'll go into how the work being done will affect you. And then uh, again, we'll be going over how to stay informed uh, about those impacts and questions and concerns about the project. So to start us off going over the approach and the how, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Rob Cheeseman. He's a Walsh Floor DBT uh, construction manager. So Rob, I'll hand it to you. I th thanks, Jesse. I'm, I'm Rob. Nice to meet you all. Um, I'm excited to be uh, part of the team that uh, gets to help bring that vision you just saw to life. It's going to be a it's going to be a fun journey over the next couple of years here. Um, so just to give you an overview of the total LBMM project um, for the past uh, year, year and a half, we've been working on the pre stage, which has been constructing the infrastructure. Um, 
new track work, uh, temporary stations that enable us to go into stage A. So once into stage A, uh, we're projecting around a two year time frame to uh, reconstruct half of the tracks. And then we'll switch to stage B, which, con which constructs the remaining tracks plus the permanent stations. Next slide, please. So here's the, you should be familiar with the geography. Um, here again, this is showing stage A, where the, the half we'll be constructing first is the east half. And then stage B will be the west half uh, of the tracks uh, from Lawrence to Bryn Mawr. Uh, next slide. Uh, gonna get in a little bit of the construction approach of, of why we're staging it the way we are. Um, here's a nice preview picture of, of the bridge, the new bridge that's gonna be up there once we're all done. Uh, next slide, please. So the reason we're building this in two stages is so we can continue to provide uh, continuous train service uh, during the construction period um, by, by installing uh, temporary stations and uh, constructing half at a time, uh, it keeps the uh, north and south side connected through the work zone. Uh, next slide. So here's a little bit more detail uh, on stage A. Um, so at, at the top and bottom of the screen, you see the interlockings, Thorndale and Montrose, which we've been working on for the past year. And the light blue uh, on the uh, west side of the tracks, on the left-hand side of the screen, uh, you'll see the uh, temporary stations uh, in, con in conjunction with the permanent stations that'll still be active through stage A construction. So once we get into stage A, the Lawrence and Berwyn stations will close uh, and service will remain open at Argyle and Bryn Mawr. Uh, Graham will get into the details a little bit more uh, regarding the service and the uh, any, any bus uh, bus changes, and again we're projecting around two years for the stage. After that, we jump into stage B, which uh, is essentially mirror. We move the trains over to the northbound side, and then reconstruct the uh, southbound side uh, with uh, temporary stations at Bryn Mawr and Argyle again. Uh, during this stage, we also, as I mentioned before, construct the uh, permanent stations at all four locations. Uh, next slide, please. So now we're going to get into how we're going to do that a uh, little step by step overview of the, uh, of the construction. Next slide. So here's, here's a few pictures of the work that's been going on so far. Uh, up at LBMM and down at the RPB area and at our precast facility, uh, building the new track structure. Um, in, a, in a general sense, you know, to build the new, you have to tear down the old. So that's, that, that'd be the first step in this process. The next major uh, step is uh, new foundations to hold up the, the, new, the new track structure. And finally, we build the new bridge, uh, which holds up the new tracks. So for the de demolition um, phase of the project, uh, we're starting at the north end uh, up at Ardmore. Uh, we start the work by uh, removing the existing tracks and uh, systems elements, uh, followed by excavation of the existing ballast um, and subgrade. And then uh, once that's complete, we, uh, we drive a line of uh, sheeting uh, to hold up the uh, old tracks while we construct the new tracks adjacent. And then that, that's uh, immediately followed by um, demolition of the existing viaducts. Uh, again, moving from north to south, uh, once the viaducts are removed, uh, we then install access ramps, which are in a short sense, removing, removing the existing retaining walls behind the curb to allow equipment uh, to cross the uh, street and uh, get back up on the embankment to continue with the the foundations, which we'll talk about next. Uh, in conjunction with this, we build a, uh, a separation barrier between the existing tracks and our work zone, which uh, allows uh, the uh, trains to safely continue. Um, and again, this is all starting here, hopefully within a month or two. Um, next is uh, installation of the drilled shafts. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the new foundations are uh, uh, 
uh, deep foundations, uh, 60 to 80 feet deep, um, around uh, six or seven feet in diameter, um, where we drill out uh, the caisson and fill it with concrete and rebar. That'll be the new foundation for the new track structure. Once that's complete, uh, we build the above grade, uh, or basically from the alley level up, the new columns and pedestals, which will hold up the new bridge itself. Next slide. Uh, once the substructure or the columns are complete, we then begin our, which, which is going to be our most interesting part of the project, is the uh, installation of the precast uh, bridge. Uh, our, our team took a unique approach to this uh, project to uh, reduce the uh, impacts to, to the public um, by building the bridge essentially offsite and bringing it in on, on uh, in short little segments. Uh, once the bridge is in place, we then uh, proceed with noise walls and tracks and uh, all the signal equipment on top to get ready uh, for stage B work. Uh, next slide. So here's the here's the uh, the interesting, real interesting part of the project that you're going to be able to see from a long distance off. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we're we're basically building the bridge off site uh, and then bringing it in on on uh, trucks, you know, uh, ten foot precast concrete segments. And this piece of equipment you see riding on top of the bridge is called the uh, overhead gantry. Um, and this this in itself is a uh, is a pretty massive piece it's roughly the size of a football field uh, it's 20 20 to 30 truckloads of materials to put it together uh, once it's in place um, off to the right on the top of the bridge you see is, is what we call a straddle carrier that'll carry the segments to the gantry system uh, from from uh, specific cross streets and once it uh, hangs these segments and uh, we tie them together, it'll lower the whole span down on top of the columns. Once that's complete, the gantry then can move itself to the next span and repeat the process all over again. Our next thing, uh, here's, a, here's a photo of the, uh, the real life segments. Uh, these are being built currently offsite. Um, the guy on top there will give you some scale of uh, how big these things things are, um, and each segment will hold up uh, two tracks. Next slide. So again, you know, following the demolition and the uh, foundation work, um, the, uh, the the gantry work will and a precast segmental bridge work will start up at Ardmore. Uh, with that's where we'll put the gantry system together and start building the spans. Um, Building, building the whole bridge span by span and moving on south. So Ardmore, ba Balmore, and Ainsley are highlighted here. Those, those will be our strategic loading locations for bringing the trucks uh, loaded with the precast segments up to the bridge location. And as I showed on the previous slide, the straddle carrier will bring those down to the, the mobile launching gantry. So if you can imagine, we build spans, we build the bridge from Ardmore to Balmoral, and then we move our loading bay operation down to Balmoral and continue on south. Uh, next slide. So this is a picture of the uh, a similar gantry that we'll be using for the loading bay. Um, this one's at the precast facility, it's on wheels. The uh, one we'll use on site will be stationary, uh, but you can imagine the truck will bring a segment in here. Um, the, this loading bay will pick it off the truck and then place it on the newly completed, completed bridge above. Um, a little bit more detail uh, to give you some more scale. Um, so imagine yourself riding the train here, going downtown. Um, this is what it's gonna look like uh, adjacent to the train tracks. Um, this is the uh, cross section of the gantry uh, on top of the new bridge as it uh, constructs a new bridge. So we, we look forward to getting this started. Uh, back to you, Jesse. Thanks, Rob, for taking through us a lot of the detail and a lot of the really interesting things about the construction itself. Okay, we're gonna go on to our next speaker.
um, in learning about the community impacts of the construction. And so for that, I'm going to turn it to Latrice Phillips-Brown. She's Government and Community Relations Liaison for the project. Oh, Latrice, could you unmute? Okay, can you guys hear me now? There you go. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I will be covering how would this work affect you? Community impacts. Impacts and mitigations. As we all know, with construction comes inconveniences. However, we will do our best to keep them to a minimum. The impacts associated with stage A construction will include the following. Noise and vibration, street closures, alley closures, dust and truck traffic, traffic lane closures, and sidewalk closures. Walsh floor will minimize and mitigate all impacts as much as possible. Mitigation efforts will include street sweeping. Whenever possible, the noisiest work activities will be performed during daytime hours. For those occasions when nighttime and or overnight work is necessary, the contractor will use noise blankets and sound barriers to minimize the noise. Water will be used to minimize the distribution of dust during demolition activities. There will be road and abatement, street cleaning, and last but not least, the contractor will be providing free pre-construction surveys for the property owners that will be directly impacted by the upcoming construction. This survey is important to you as a property owner because it will establish a baseline of the existing and current conditions of your property before the start of construction. The first round of pre-construction survey letters were sent out to residents from north of Ardmore Avenue to Bryn Mawr Avenue in mid-January. A second notice was sent out in mid-February. We have received minimal responses to these letters. If you are a property owner north of Armour Avenue to Bryn Mawr Avenue, please reach out to us following this meeting. Information on how to contact us will be provided at the end of the presentation. If you have property south of Bryn Mawr Avenue, pre-construction survey letters will be sent to you prior to the start of construction in your area. Next slide. Public way impacts, alleys. There will be rolling closures of the alleys behind Winthrop Avenue and the cross streets. During these closures, access to garages and or parking spaces will be prohibited. Free alternative parking will be provided to those residents who will be impacted. Walsh floor will be responsible for maintaining garbage and recycling pickup during these alley closures. Next slide. Streets. Extended street closures are anticipated for all major and side streets going north to south from Ardmore Avenue to Lawrence Avenue. Work on the major streets are currently planned to occur over weekends. However, we will work with the aldermen to figure out the best times work should take place. Next slide. Roadway impacts, trucks. During construction, there will be an increase in truck traffic within the community. You will see dump trucks lined up removing excavated materials from the work sites, as well as a significant amount of trucks unloading under the viaduct at Armour. All trucks entering and exiting the project area will follow the routes approved by CDOT. I will now turn it over to Marcy Jensen, Outreach and Communication Representative for Walsh Floor. Thank you, Latrice. Stage A construction will intermittently block parking for residents with parking spaces or garages along the east side of the tracks from Leland to Thorndale. These are residents on the west side of Winthrop, even numbers from 4700 to 5828 North. These parking impacts will start this spring on the north side of the project, the 5800 block, moving south. We know this is an inconvenience to residents, and we will continue to do everything we can to minimize these disruptions. You will be notified in advance of these closures. Walsh Floor is providing alternate parking during these interruptions. The locations of our alternate parking lots are pictured here. Affected residents can use our parking app to secure one of these free alternate parking places. 
Some alleys will be closed on a daily basis from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. and residents will have access to their own spaces at the end of the day. Some alleys will be closed on an extended basis for several days or multiple weeks. For affected residents, please join us in the parking breakout section of this meeting or contact us to learn how to access our alternative lots. Thank you. All right, thank you, Marcy and Latrice for taking us through the impacts uh, to the communities. Uh, now going to turn it to Graham Garfield. He is a RPM general manager with CTA and he will be talking specifically on service impacts to CTA customers. Thanks, Jesse. Um, as he, Jesse mentioned, I'll talk a little bit about the impacts to both rail and bus service, as well as impacts to the four stations in the project area. One thing that's important to highlight is that CTA will maintain red and purple line service throughout the construction period. So red and purple line trains will continue to operate uh, between Howard 95th through the project area as they do today. During construction, however, Lawrence and Berwyn will temporarily close. Argyle and Bryn Mawr will remain open through the use of temporary station facilities. The temporary stations will serve passengers until all four new stations are completed, which is anticipated by the end of 2024. Because the four tracks of the red line and purple line have to be merged into two tracks during construction, there will be some minor delays that can be expected. We strongly recommend that you allow a little extra travel time to make sure that you reach your destination on time. There will be some bus impacts during the project as well. These impacts are primarily to reroute buses that connect with closed red line stations to other red line stations to make sure to maintain those bus rail connections for transferring passengers. The number 81 Lawrence bus will be rerouted south to connect to the Wilson red line station. The 92 Foster bus will be rerouted north to connect to the Bryn Mawr temporary station. The 146 bus, which currently goes to Berwyn Station, will continue to operate on its current route and will begin and end in its current location at Berwyn just east of Broadway. I'll now go through the four affected stations with a little bit more detail uh, for customers who, who may be um, passengers, regulars of those stations. If your station is Lawrence, your station will close at the beginning of stage A construction in spring 2021 and will remain closed throughout the construction period. It will reopen with a brand new station by the end of 2024. If you use Lawrence, you can access the red line either by going a quarter mile south to the Wilson station or a quarter mile north to the temporary Argyle station. The number 36 Broadway bus, which runs parallel to the red line, also connects to both the Wilson and Argyle stations. And as mentioned previously, the 81 Lawrence bus, which connects to the station, will be rerouted to Wilson as well. If your station is Argyle, you will use the temporary Argyle station. The original station house under the viaduct will close to be demolished and rebuilt but the temporary station is immediately adjacent to the west next to the embankment. A new station will open by the end of 2024. If your station is Berwyn, your station will temporarily close in spring 2021 and will reopen with a brand new station by the end of 2024. If you need to access the red line, you can use the temporary Bryn Mawr station a half mile north or the temporary Argyle station a quarter mile to the south. The number 36 Broadway bus, as mentioned, runs parallel to the red line and connects to both of these stations. Finally, if Bryn Mawr is your station, you will use a temporary Bryn Mawr station. The setup of the temporary Bryn Mawr station will be a little bit different. 
it'll have two separate entrances to serve each direction of travel. Southbound passengers needing trains towards downtown and 95th will board at a new temporary entrance, which is pictured here on Broadway, a half block north of Bryn Mawr. Northbound passengers needing trains toward Howard will board using the current Bryn Mawr entrance under the viaduct. Number 92 Foster buses, which currently connect to Berwyn, will be rerouted to connect to the Bryn Mawr station instead. Eventually, in a later phase of construction, the original station house will be closed to be demolished and rebuilt, with the new Bryn Mawr station opening by the end of 2024. All right. Thank you, Graham, for taking us through the service impacts. Okay, I'm going to just go over uh, the myriad of ways that uh, we on the RPM team are uh, trying to keep you informed. Um, so we can go to the next slide to look at those. Uh, obviously, this virtual meeting uh, during these pandemic times, uh, we, we can't meet in person as readily, um, but uh, this is part of our efforts to stay in touch um, despite the limitations that the pandemic is bringing. Uh, we're also going to, going to be doing block by block meetings at a smaller scale. Um, so please, um, if when you get uh, information for that and it's impacting you on your block, uh, please attend those. Um, we've also been doing the last several months virtual uh, monthly office hours. Um, that's a form for uh, anyone who has questions that um, may need more than just an email response um, where you can actually talk to uh, the RPM team um, in, a, in a virtual setting. Um, so stay tuned for those as well if you're, if you're not already getting those alerts. Um, speaking of which, um, we highly encourage everyone to sign up for our, our alerts where we uh, let people know about the virtual office hours and we let people know about the uh, construction updates ver via uh, email e-blasts. Um, so I highly recommend that you uh, sign up for the alerts for this, pro this uh, uh, project to get those um, alerts. Um, of course, we have our website as well. Um, social media, uh, we are on Twitter, we are on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, so please follow us. We'll be sending out information about impacts, fun facts, things, ways to know more about uh, what this project is doing for CTA in this community and also promoting uh, the businesses that are part of the Open for Business program. Um, and lastly, we are uh, going to launch an interactive uh, map for construction impacts from RPM. So that'll be another way that you can see the different ways that the, the uh, construction is impacting the communities. And uh, here are the different uh, venues to sign up or get information online. Um, so take a screenshot or we'll be, we'll be sending all of this information out as well to attendees and people who registered. Um, but our, um, our updates from, from, from a service uh, standpoint are there on the transitchicago.com slash updates uh, website. Uh, we have our RPM website, our RP, RPM email that I promise a real life person uh, checks every day. Um, and then we have uh, our way to uh, just sign up for those alerts that I mentioned previously. So highly encourage you to sign up for the alerts um, because that is where you can uh, put a location and get in, um, impact alerts specifically for the locations that you're interested in, whether you work or you live in a certain location in the project footprint. And then of course, uh, phone numbers as well. So um, that's how you can stay in, uh, in touch with us. Next slide. All right, so I'm gonna say goodbye to those who are on Facebook Live. Uh, it, Zoom doesn't allow you to stick with us for the breakout rooms, um, but we're gonna move over to our, our breakout room portion of the meeting. Um, so how this is, will work is we're gonna have two separate sec, um, sessions for the breakout rooms. Each of them will be 15 minutes um, where people can ask questions. Um, and we ask you to do so by uh, using the raise your hand reaction from Zoom, um, most likely on, on your screen near the bottom, uh, where uh, you can then unmute yourself and show your video, ask questions to the subject matter experts that are within the rooms. Um, there'll be ground, ru ground rules, will be gone over uh, in each one, but obviously no inappropriate behavior uh, is gonna be tolerated in those. 
Um, so what's going to happen next is uh, there, there should be a pop-up that comes up on your screen. Um, you'll see the different options for the breakout rooms that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Uh, pick the one that is most applicable. You click the join, the blue join buttons. Um, and if you don't see the pop-up, uh, just take a look at the uh, tab in Zoom that, that says breakout rooms. Uh, you should be able to access it that way as well. Um, if you would like to continue using the ASL language support, uh, we ask that you stay here in this main room. Um, that is where we will have general questions uh, about the project and the presentation that we saw, and then also the ASL support. Um, and uh, lastly, we encourage you that um, if, you're, if there isn't time for you to ask your question um, uh, via the video, uh, please put your questions in the chats so that we can follow up with those uh, for each one. So uh, I have the power and I will now have the, uh, the pop-up window come up for the breakout rooms. Come on up. Um, just wanna extend thanks to everyone for taking time out of your evening to learn about this project, listen to what we have to say about it. Um, these are, again, a part of our efforts to stay transparent and stay in touch uh, with all those affected by the, the project um, as much as we can, e even during the pandemic. So, again, here's the um, website, phone number, information. Uh, again, emphasize that signing up for alerts is the best way to just get uh, the applicable information to you sent right to your inbox. Um, and then if go to the next slide. Highly encourage everyone to go to our uh, social media pages. And um, when you're there, just smash that follow button, smash the like button, and just follow what we have to say. Well, you'll see a lot of good content and uh, very informational content too. Um, so again, thank you everyone. And I uh, hope everyone has a great evening. Uh, we'll stay in touch.